Earth is an incredibly unique planet. Not only does it support the only known biosphere in the universe, but it is the largest rocky world in our solar system, where every ounce of material combined with Venus, Mars, and Mercury would be the only way to equal our size. We have an abundance of elements and materials spread throughout our crust, with so much more locked within our core. We have harnessed these raw materials to create incredible machines that have elevated our lives and sent ourselves and our devices to the far corners of our solar system. The pathway is clear. We will need more resources to create more machines, rockets, devices, and homes for our descendants so that they can enjoy larger horizons. But Earth, for however large it may be, is still finite, and the expansion of humanity is seemingly infinite. We will need more, but where can we turn when our home world has been tapped dry? What other world could offer the abundance of resources our own does, and could we harness one before destroying our own? NASA has already begun the process of developing ways to use what we can find on our solar neighbors, and these processes while still in their infancy, have the promise to unlock limitless expansion. This is the process of ISRU. ISRU stands for In-Situ Resource Utilization, and will be essential to both future space projects as well as our first permanent settlements on other worlds. The definition for ISRU is the using of materials found on worlds other than Earth to create fuel, water, oxygen, and building materials for use by our astronauts and settlers. Everything we have ever sent into space has been made here on Earth, using Earth's resources. If we land a settlement on Mars or the Moon, they will still need materials to build more habitats, oxygen to breathe, and water to drink. Water can be recycled nearly infinitely, as some small losses will occur, but only about 50% of the oxygen we recycle can be used with our current technology. If we establish a starting base on Mars or the Moon, we will need to send them constant supplies to keep them operational and alive, which will cost an immense amount to uphold, as shipping things to other worlds using rockets is extremely expensive. If this supply chain breaks down even for a few shipments, our crew could die on their worlds, as we still have problems with rockets being delayed or destroyed on launch. We need to look to another option for generating food, air, water, and materials wherever we send our pioneers, something that seems impossible on sterile, radioactive, and poisonous worlds. So how do we find and collect these materials? Let's look at the moon first, as we would most likely send our first interplanetary colonists there. The moon is close to Earth. Beneficial if an emergency on base or in the supply chain occurs, as our colonists could abandon and fly back to Earth in only about three days. Compared to the many months it takes to get to and from Mars, as well as the 26 months it takes from Mars to align with Earth for both return and outbound travel. If something occurred on a Martian base outside of this narrow window, we would have to wait almost two years to rescue our colonists, who would most likely be dead by the time aid arrived. The moon is also an excellent first stop to the stars, as it offers a low gravity environment to stop and refuel around without crowding Earth's orbit. The moon can also be used to perform orbital assists both in accelerating a ship away and slowing them down on arrival to our Earth system. An orbital assist is when a ship uses the gravitational well of a body to either use its orbital momentum to give or reduce speed. A base of operations on or around the moon would make for an excellent center of transportation around the solar system as the moon would most likely be used extensively to perform these orbital assists. NASA is already working on such a station, named the Gateway. It would serve as a halfway point between Earth and Mars missions, a refueling station and temporary crew habitat. But these options are only to assist the journey out from our homeworld. How would we use the resources of other planets to establish ourselves on them? And what resources do our planetary neighbors have that we could use? It is now well known that both the Moon and Mars have large amounts of water ice either within craters on the poles or in the soil. Water will be vital not only for our crew to drink, but for our machines to use in creating fuels and breathable oxygen. Water, H2O, is two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen, and can be broken down into those individual elements using electricity. Hydrogen is an excellent rocket propellant, especially when cooled to liquid temperatures, 
something easy to do on the cold surfaces of both the Moon and Mars. Oxygen can also be separated from the Martian atmosphere, being almost 96% carbon dioxide through similar methods to our water separation. This process has proven to be viable as a source of breathable air, as a module on the latest Martian rover, the Perseverance, has created almost 6 grams of oxygen by electrolysis at this time. This module on board the rover is only a 1 to 100 scale of what we could build to do this task, but it is one of the only experiments we have ever made and activated to explore what we can do with ISRU. We have done very little else to explore our other options through practical application, and most of our other possible methods for exploiting the natural resources of other worlds are still theoretical. So how do we know we could use metals on other worlds to construct habitats? Simple. We've done it here on Earth already, a planet where the only difference in accessibility is the atmosphere and liquid water we are surrounded by that promotes life. We've already mined metals from our own planet with relative ease. How hard would it be to do on other ones? Martian soil and surface rocks contain large amounts of iron, titanium, aluminum, and magnesium, metals that are essential to construction. Trace amounts of gold, copper, lithium, tungsten, and nickel have also been detected showing signs that larger amounts may be found beneath the surface. Some of the metals that have been found on the moon's surface are silicon, iron, calcium, aluminum, and titanium, everything necessary to create large and stable structures that could support human activity on or within its surface. It's clear that everything we would need to create bases, vehicles, and equipment are already present on our prospective first new worlds, but how would we go about procuring, processing, and assembling them? Sending a drone with mining capabilities to these worlds, especially the moon, is pretty easy, as nearly every rover we have sent to them has been equipped with a drilling rig for sample analyzation. Sending a larger drilling module equipped with a furnace for refining and smelting these metals into usable chunks would be our first step towards using these materials for construction. Actually using these metals would be a whole other problem. Advanced machinery capable of turning a lump of copper into wire is extremely delicate, precise, and needs constant supervision and human interaction to work just here on Earth, and is in no way capable of doing the same on another world with vastly different environmental conditions if we just took the machine and copy-pasted it onto the surface of another planet. We will need to make advancements in how our assembly machines can complete these tasks, as well as how we can create assembly lines. One machine is most often only capable of performing one task, such as creating metallic ingots for use or cutting them down for processing, or turning those sheets into tensile wiring, and then coating those wires for use in electrical systems. One machine that does all of these things is still a dream of the future, but is possible with more advancements in miniaturization of these processes. There is also the problem of shipping and landing these large assembly lines of machines to other worlds, as well as ensuring their delicate mechanics survive the journey and landing. Our first shipments to other worlds may need to consist of multiple payloads full of a variety of machines, as well as backup assemblers and transportation systems. One possibility is the landing of simple smelting and mining robots that send their products to small rockets that carry the metals into orbit, where a zero-gravity facility then refines these parts without the risk of landing more delicate robots needed to create useful structural components on the surface of that planet. This would probably be a very early version version of what we would need, as rockets would be costly to operate without dedicated fuel collectors and refiners on the surface. But these rockets would also have a major advantage to our own earthly ones, as the low gravity of both the Moon and Mars would offer little resistance to orbital flights, making the rocket needed to transport materials much smaller than if it had been launching from the surface of Earth. The Moon also has no atmosphere to fight through, and would make surface-to-orbit transportation far easier and cheaper than Terran ones. Eventually, we will need to establish these refining facilities on the surface of our colonies, but this will need our involvement in the earliest stages. A human presence in a simple habitat nearby to the mining facilities will be needed to turn those raw materials into usable parts, as human labor using tools is a far easier thing to maintain than a delicate and reliant machine. 
So we land a habitat and some mining drones and begin the requisition of metals and ices, while a revolving crew turns them into more advanced machines that are supervised and maintained initially. Our pioneers use these materials to expand their base and turn them into fuel and air. Eventually we will have a working factory that will need little human intervention to ship materials around our world or into orbit to create more space stations. But all of this refining and mining will take a massive amount of energy. So where would we get this energy? Solar panels are an obvious option, and the necessary materials to create them already exist on the surface of the moon. But solar panels only work when the planet is experiencing daytime. Meanwhile, days on the moon are two weeks long, and the night a similar amount of time. Two weeks of darkness will exhaust even our most robust batteries when powered by solar panels, and we will need another method to survive these lunar nights. While there is no oil or coal on the moon or Mars, that we know of at least, there is also no life present to endanger other than our own. Nuclear generators and reactors could be shipped to our colonies, creating a stable and safe amount of power no matter the light level using the water we mine to create the necessary reactions. While nuclear fusion is one of the safest and least polluting methods known for power generation, we would not need to worry about getting rid of these spent nuclear materials, as the surface of the moon is already blasted with more radiation than even our most dangerous dump sites. This radiation could also be harnessed from space itself in currently theoretical methods to generate power from nothing but the energy of space itself. This theoretical method is, however, also massively dependent on the sun, as the vast majority of the radiation that bakes the moon and earth, and well, everything else, comes from the sun. If fusion technology is discovered soon enough in our colonization efforts, it would become the gold standard for power generation on other worlds, as it uses hydrogen, the most plentiful element in the universe, and creates no fallout if a catastrophic collapse occurs. But all of these reactors being shipped to other worlds would be a costly first investment as even our smallest reactors are quite heavy and delicate. Solar panels would most likely see the first of our efforts in colonization through, but would need to be replaced by better methods in the future. On Mars, the days are similar in length to our own, making solar power more viable, but would need human maintenance in cleaning and repairing them from the gentle dusting they would receive from Martian dust storms. These would be our first and currently planned efforts for the colonization of other worlds. But what could be possible when we have already established vast factories on other planets? We can again look to our own planet for answers, as we have already dotted the globe with massive industrial collectors, refiners, transportation systems, and manufacturing manufacturing facilities. Once we have a stable human presence on the world, we can then expand just as we have here on Earth, creating everything needed to make cities, vehicles, and future missions to other worlds. We could create even larger factories on planets without worrying about taking up valuable space, as most of the land on these worlds would be unusable for anything other than manufacturing. Different planets also offer different types of abundant resources. For example, our gas giants are high in hydrogen, helium, and methane elements useful for both fuel and manufacturing. These gas giants would make inexhaustible nigh-infinite fuel sources for both early chemical rockets and futuristic fusion reactors. In fact, most of the elements we would be mining from ices on other worlds can be found in abundance floating in gas giant atmospheres, making them the primary source. But we also have to consider the size of the planets we will be harvesting, as the more gravity they have, the more expensive and difficult it will be to get their resources elsewhere. Jupiter is absolutely massive, more so than is conceivable. The sheer size of its magnetic field, if it were visible to our eyes, would dwarf the moon's size in our night sky. Its field reaches out 3 million miles and is 15 times wider than our sun. Jupiter may have the most of what we want, but it will be extremely dangerous to harvest with its massive gravity well capable of stabilizing the rest of the planets in our solar system. It would be a massive undertaking to simply set up a logistics and mining system around it, let alone reach it safely, as Jupiter also gives off a massive amount of radiation. We would probably not go there first in search of easy hydrogen, making Saturn or Uranus close seconds in resource abundance, but primary for ease of access. A theoretical way to harvest these gases from the surface of gas giants is, quite literally, a planetary chainsaw. Now what in God's name is that? 
Well, the teeth on a chainsaw is actually what cuts the wood, cutting and scooping material away from the tree as it spins. A planetary chainsaw would be a massive ring of quickly rotating buckets capable of scooping massive amounts of material from the atmospheres of these planets. Only one small side of the chainsaw would touch the world as it spun, as if the entirety of it was within the atmosphere it would slow down and crash. Instead it would carry the material high into space as the smaller portion of the lower end is slightly decelerated, giving the higher layers ample time to speed back up using either electric propulsion or using some of the harvested gases for fuel. This could be what an established presence of mining habitats could look like in the far future, but to start harvesting these gas giants, we would most likely use ships to dive and resurface while opening gas nets or canisters to catch their resources. Our galaxy alone has trillions of times more resources than our solar system, and we could harvest them all, but what would we build with them, even in our earliest stages? Well, much the same things as we do here on Earth. Colonists will want to make worlds as much like our own as they can. As they build cities and terraform their own worlds, they can begin to make luxury products such as electronics, vehicles, and entertainment. They can even export rare products around the galaxy. Wouldn't you want to try a liquor brewed on another world, or watch a movie filmed with a chase scene through a truly alien landscape? How about a diamond necklace with gems forged on each of the planets in our solar system? or even scientific findings from millions of different laboratories, each studying something different. But I can hear the more practical thinkers out there as they listen to this video. What would a sudden limitless amount of resources, from common to extremely rare, do to the economy of our world or even a collection of worlds? If we kept our current form of currency, a paper or metal IOU sometimes backed by an equal amount of gold, would collapse completely with the paper notes becoming a more rare resource than the gold they represent. Think about it. On Earth, we are surrounded by trees and wood, but have to spend time and resources digging up gold for use in our other economies. But when you consider the entirety of the universe as a source of materials, our earthly trees are far more rare material than the endless amounts of once precious elements that surround us. An interesting way to avoid this kind of collapse would be the control of wood to create value in printing paper notes themselves, being backed now by the scarcity of the wood that comprises them. Now, instead of trading gold for an inconsequential note of equal value, you would be carrying both the notes that signify value as well as the equal amount of paper that the note is worth. Paper money could even be mixed with a more common resource to devalue that paper into a smaller denomination like a penny that is only coated in copper and not entirely comprised of the valuable metal. But then again, who uses paper money to pay for things even in our current time? Only about 19% of the purchases made in the United States last year were done using paper money, the rest of which used a digital method. This percentage of cash usages was also 7% less than the amount used in the previous year, with a steady decline in the usage of physical cash arising. Perhaps this relapse to physical currency will not occur in the future, and a more adaptable electronic method will be preferable. How would something like this work? I would like to point out at this point that I am not educated in the ways of the economy. I'm studying math and science at Clemson to become a science teacher, and not a teacher of finance, so please take my conjectures with a grain of salt. If anyone watching disagrees with something I posit, or could think of a much better method to adapt these sudden acquisitions of wealth into our planetary economies, then please leave a comment with your corrections slash theories. I realize that no matter how much I have already learned, there is still far much more that I have not, and I am by no means the arbiter in speaking about such topics. But how do I think we could adapt a future economic system to account for the flow of resources we once held as incredibly rare as though we were means to our ends? We would need to completely reevaluate what backs our currencies, even if they only exist as data. Something of equal value must always be traded for something needed. That is the primary basis of trade and purchasing that has existed even before money. Something must be used to give our currency or data value, where that currency can be exchanged for that valued resource. What would a civilization with so much physical wealth hold as a rare resource? Scientists call such civilizations post-scarcity ones, as scarcities of water, food, or materials for each and every one of their inhabitants has vanished completely. There is no worry about where anyone's next meal or drink will come from, no need to search and barter for materials they will need to accomplish their desires. There is no scarcity, no value of one material over another, everyone has more than enough. 
So, what would they value over an endless supply of everything imaginable? Perhaps time would become one of the only valuable forms, as time cannot be gained or increased, only spent. This, of course, could be altered drastically by humanity's efforts to extend our own lives, but how we spend our time would not change no matter the amount we had been given. The now is always happening, with the future becoming the past at a rate of one second per second. Perhaps a person could spend an agreed upon amount of time working for someone else, who in turn would need to spend time on a task that the employee requested as payment for the service. I will spend a year building you a ship with near light speed capabilities in exchange for a year of using that ship as part of my resource collection fleet. But if you pay an extra year, your ship could be outfitted with the finest systems and luxuries that our infinite amount of materials can manage. But two years of use for my design will be required. After the time agreed upon, that contract expires, and you now have a brand new ship to do with as you please, having lost only a few years of your life in acquiring it. Or perhaps we will revert in a more practical way back to the rarity of knowledge or skill. In the days of the blacksmith, they were held in high regard as masters of steel. They performed their crafts to the point of an almost mystical reverence. Those who watched them work considered their products to be magical as surely the use of base metals to concoct a blade or armor of far greater strength than the sum of their parts had to be alchemy. In truth, this was because blacksmiths had studied the science of their metals that they used and knew just what to do to make stronger and more durable things from their materials. Only a blacksmith can take iron and create an ingot, and only the clockmaker can create a delicate spring from that ingot. As our species has commanded a greater control over our planet, we have become a specialized race. One person can take up a niche role instead of having to be a simultaneous hunter, guard, and farmer in the early days of humanity. This specialization will only increase as unique job requirements continue to develop with our technology. Need a captain for your expedition to another star system? Only someone who has mastered communication, leadership, and knowledge of engineering could accomplish this. Need someone to create more harvesting robots for you? Only someone versed in coding, material science, and an owner of a capable facility could do this job. Even in our modern world, this rarity and valuing of specialized trade is held in high regard. This is the reason why freelancers are paid so highly for tasks that the client does not have the knowledge or even simply the time to complete themselves. Perhaps in the future, the amount of tasks you have the knowledge or capability to perform could establish your level of relevance and wealth in society. A Star Trek-esque path begins to emerge, as in the world of Gene Roddenberry, your knowledge of different things as well as your service to the fleet dictated your status in society, at least the human one. This status is theorized to allow greater access to materials and services in the Star Trek universe. As always, when theorizing about the path our distant future will take, it is unlikely to go as expected. Only time will tell how we adapt to the inevitable increase our civilization will experience in precious materials, as well as materials to be used in furthering our grip on the galaxy. Once we establish ourselves on a world and make it as easy and safe to live on as our own, the sky is no longer the limit on what we can build. Truly inhospitable planets could become massive worldwide factories supplying the rest of the galaxy with anything and everything they need. Frozen worlds could host gigantic computing facilities running theoretically perfectly in the cold. Another thing we may want to begin constructing are megastructures like Dyson Swarms to harvest the stars for power, a topic I have covered in a past video which you can watch here. Other megastructures could encircle entire planets that supply the upper layers with resources while hosting not billions, but trillions and quadrillions of people. ISRU methods today are still in their infancy, but are necessary if we want to build bases on other planets, let alone colonize them. They will continue to grow and develop into more versatile and refined methods of bending the universe to our will, but for now we can only imagine what incredible things we can do with all this dead universe around us just waiting to be filled with life, both human and otherwise. Thank you for watching.